five or ten minute disruptions as people kind of wander in the subways are always slow Monday morning. So we'll get rolling in about uh, five minutes. But in the meantime, let me um, make a few preliminary announcements and then introduce our, our co-chairman. The um, My responsibility is continuing legal education. And uh, as you probably know, we run many programs, 50 or 60 a year. This year, we'll probably be up to about 75. And one of the great problems that I have in organizing the programs is my own background. I'm somewhat of a victim of my own civil litigation past. I'm not familiar with many areas of law. And so I rely on members of the profession to come forward with suggestions for either programs or speakers or formats. And if you had a chance to look at the lawyer's update calendar that was uh, sent out a while ago, I said in, in the letter, I invited the people in the letter to come forward and make those suggestions. And I want to reinforce that idea. There are so many areas of law that are worthy of discussion at this level, but that don't get done by the law society simply because we're not made aware that these are current issues. And uh, it's, it's very well to take Hallsbury's off the shelf and start at A and work your way through to Z. But the, the point is to make programs available in a, in a timely manner. In other words, programs that are of interest to people today that are current. So I urge you in the evaluation forms that you have, in addition to any other comments you want to make about this particular program, Throw in any suggestions that you have, either in a general or a specific way, about programs or speakers. And uh, don't worry about uh, the availability or the advisability of any program. If it's a program of interest to you, then I promise you I will follow it up. And if you'd be kind enough to put your name and number in there, I'll give you a call and we can discuss uh, the items in a little more elaboration. But I do urge you to, to do that. Also, at the same time, please take a moment at the end of the day to fill out the evaluation forms. These forms are very important to us even though they're, they're a pain for you to, to uh, fill out. They really are another way of uh, helping us evaluate the programs and fine-tuning them and shaping them. And I do need your, your cooperation in doing that. If you prefer, give me a call or visit my office or write me a letter uh, about the type of program that we have today, the speakers, the content, anything you, you like or don't like, any improvements. But do, uh, do spend a moment at some point and do that, preferably before the Blue Jays get started or we may, may lose some of you. Uh, the other thing, last thing I'll say is that uh, during the break we'll have on display by the registration desk some other CLE publications which may be of interest to you. They are available for sale and you can, if you order them during the earlier part of the day, you can pick them up at the end. So just casually go out there and have a look and uh, ask the staff any questions about what they are. But they, occasionally there's something in there that might really catch your eye. Now, today's program is rent review and I confess that uh, the last time I handled rent review was uh, Oh, part four of the act about 1970 and my education began and ended with Morley Gorsky's article in special lectures and I'm certainly impressed with the complexity and the, um, the intensity of the legislation. Uh, we're fortunate to have as uh, co-chairman for this morning's program two people who represent uh, competing interests but at the same time a, a certain consensus about the importance of the legislation and the political and I think the philosophical implications. The uh, Bob Dumaney, who is a partner at uh, Gardner Roberts, has been very active in this area. He's uh, chaired a number of panels for Canadian Bar Association. He's written a number of papers in various areas. Uh, he's been involved in the legislative developments. Um, he's past chairman of the municipal law section of the CBAO. And of course, he's very well known at the uh, continuing legal education level, where he's written papers and presented speeches. And I'd like to have you here, Bob. Our other co-chairman represents perhaps the other half or I guess you'd say two-thirds of the, of the scale of a landlord and tenant review. That's Richard Fink who is seated to my left. And um, Richard may, I, I think I would not be unfair in characterizing him as uh, Mr. Landlord and Tenant Legislation. He's been socially and politically active for many, many years in uh, all the developments in legislation going back to the early 70s. And um, I think he wouldn't uh, uh, talk about that in his own terms, but I'll tell you that he has been instrumental in many of the items and his practice now is specialization in rent review, landlord and tenant, and as an aside, I guess, uh, workers' compensation, but we won't be talking about that today. It's a pleasure now to introduce Richard Fink. Thank you. I'd like to uh, take a few minutes uh, to uh, make some introductory remarks and try and explain to you uh, what we're doing. And, and I'd like to uh, preface that 
uh, with a, a question I'm always asked at tenants meetings. I go to tenants meetings about uh, once per week to meet uh, with various clients and inevitably I'm always asked the following question and the question is how can it be that the landlord's asking me to pay 20 percent rent increase when the law says 4.7 percent and I always think that that's a legal question I always get into this trap that I'm being asked a legal question and I always give this reply, I explain how the law works, capital expenditures, and I say if the landlord spends $1,000 on new ashtrays in the lobbies, uh, then he has to get a return on his investment. And I get another question back. And the question is, if the landlord wants new ashtrays, why do I have to pay? The same problem, I think, is going to arise today. Uh, because uh, Joel Combe, uh, said to me, Richard, we want you to explain how rent review works. We want it practice-oriented. We just don't want lectures here today. We want something practical. We want mock hearings. So I thought it would be a good idea to take the uh, audience through the magical and imaginative land of rent review uh, that has been designed by 12 years of bureaucratic mind and give you an in-depth view as to how rent increases are obtained, how they're defended. But what gave me pause was last week I got seven calls from lawyers because they saw my picture in the magazine, so they figured here's a soft touch for free legal advice. I got seven calls from lawyers, and, and what do they want? They want to know what should I do when I've got a building with illegal rents? What should I do when I'm acting for a purchaser and we're purchasing a building and it may have illegal rents? And how the heck can I get out of this legislation? Well, at 11 o'clock today, Julius Melnitzer and Ken Hale They'll be addressing those items, which are sort of your bread and butter, day-to-day -day items, contact you'll have with rent review. And, it, and it'll be in plenty of time before the baseball game. But for the rest of the day, we're going to be doing an analysis of obtaining rent increases and defending them. And I think the best place to start is in the thinner piece of materials that you got, the thinner book. It's divided by alphabet with little yellow dividers. B is the key document for today. If you turn to item B. So the way they're organized is first there's an index, then there's item A, and then there's item B. Ah, some people are finding it. Good. Item B is a cost revenue statement. And it's the cost revenue statement and the landlord's application that kicks things off. And our first speaker is going to be John Andrade, and I'll give an introduction to him in a moment, but he's going to be representing the landlord. He's going to kick things off. He's going to explain to you how the landlord starts it off. And this is towards getting a rent increase. Then the tenants will reply, that's myself. Then Andrade gets one final bite at the apple, because as I will allege throughout today, the system's biased towards the landlord. And then Mr. Renecki sitting on my left uh, from Rent Review Services will give his response and how they make the order. Then Bob Dumaney is going to have a panel. He's going to try and embarrass all three of us. Then we're going to have a break. If people have questions, write them down during the break, and we'll try and take a few questions after the break. And then we'll move on uh, to uh, the parts with uh, Ken Hale and uh, Julius Melnitzer. So if I might start, I'm going to introduce uh, John Andrade to my right, who will uh, start you off with the cost revenue statement. Uh, John Andrade has a graduate degree in economics from uh, UBC, but that's not why I invited him. Uh, John Andrade is one of the architects of the current legislation uh, because in 1986 uh, he served on the Rent Review Advisory Committee to the ministry, and the Rent Review Advisory Committee came up with many of the ideas behind the legislation. Uh, the second reason I invited John Andrade was because he's one of the premier consultants uh, in rent review for landlords. So a great deal of the time, if you're defending matters for tenants, you're going to see John Andrade as the person who's uh, carrying the landlord's ball. And uh, he's one of the innovative uh, landlord's consultants. Don't take that as a compliment. And I think uh, he's the perfect person to uh, start off uh, the ball rolling in terms of a uh, landlord's application that he hopes will probably net the landlord a sizable uh, trip around the world and a couple jags. John. Clip this on you here and go offset. Okay. 
Thank you, Richard. One of the interesting things I find is that uh, lawyers who I work with in the field say to me, well, I keep hearing this thing is law because I see this cost revenue statement which you prepare, and then I keep hearing, rather they say they keep hearing, they keep hearing it's law, but they can't understand how come it's law because there's a cost revenue statement which looks awfully similar to what accountants prepare f for income tax. And then they get caught up in the whole idea that it's a number crunching game, and then they go to a hearing after divested themselves of the legal equities of the case and find that indeed it comes back t to law after all. My end of this is to look at the numbers and throughout the proceeding I want you to bear in mind something. Rent review is a numbers game but it really isn't purely a numbers game. Even under the regulations which are now in place and the operating guide a copy of which you have, you will see that there are certain areas of discretion and there are certain types of criteria which are used, which as lawyers will realize arise from uh, concepts of law rather than con concepts of finance or accounting. What you have before you is a cost revenue statement which has been filed in support of, of the application for rent review. I think it's important that you understand the principal components of a rent increase. A landlord may go to rent review to get a rent increase because he has a financial loss. And a financial loss can arise in two ways. It can arise, first of all, because he has had an extraordinary cost increase. For example, his taxes went up significantly and he didn't go to rent review in the previous year. And he may have a financial loss which is not due to a purchase. More commonly at rent review, financial losses are due to acquisitions. That is to say, landlords go out, they buy buildings, and after acquiring these buildings, there is a significant increase in the level of financing on title, and that uh, financing on title leads to a financial loss. And as Richard mentioned earlier, the tenants often say, well, he, he bought a building. Why do I have to pay for it? And I guess the, uh, the flip answer, the glib answer is that the law says so. Uh, Section 75 of the Act outlines certain cr criteria. And one of them is the financial loss. And financial loss has been a very hot topic and it is limited under the Act. A, a landlord may incur a financial loss on a purchase and he may go to rent review to recover that but it is limited to 5% of his rental revenue in each application year. Probably we can go into the cost revenue. If I could ask you to turn to page B9. And page B9 indicates the, the starting point of the, the cause of application. And that is that the landlord acquired the, cost, the, acquired the, the complex in, uh, in December of 1986, and he paid $11 million. And Rent Review requires that a landlord making an application state quite clearly in the section precisely what he has done. He bought the building, he paid legal fees, he paid land transfer tax, and he paid a total of $11,138,000. In order to acquire the building, the landlord either assumed certain financing or has put new financing in place. And actually, to go back very, uh, go back one page to page B7. And at page B7, here's where the landlord reports that he had a first mortgage, which he, he assumed, because the mortgage was put in place in October of 86, uh, two months before he acquired the title, and he assumed that, that mortgage. And on page B8 following, you will ob observe that the landlord uh, obtained from the vendor 
a second mortgage on closing. So in order to finance the acquisition of just over $11 million, the landlord assumed the first mortgage of 3668000 and he took a new second mortgage of approximately $8 million. Now, the landlord also has to demonstrate his operating costs because at, at rent review, when you go and you make a claim for financial loss, you have to show that your revenue minus your operating costs minus your new financing, and the financing has certain limitations, but those three, but the revenue minus those two components produce a cash loss. And rent review defines a cash loss as being operating costs as incurred in an accounting period minus principal and interest payments on the mortgage. You should note that rent review does not allow depreciation, but does allow for, for principal repayment of, of mortgages. So on page B11, the landlord has to report his operating costs. However, another section of the Act permits the landlord to rely on previous operating costs found in a previous application if that application was within three years of the current application. And if at that time the, the landlord, which may or may not be the current landlord, in this example it's not, if at that time the landlord produced operating cost documents. And under item three on page B11, which is cost revenue five, you will note that there was a previous order on the 14th of October 1986 for rents effective the 1st of May 1986. And at that time, operating costs were found amounting to $939,000. So, in this hypothetical case, the landlord who acquired the complex in December of 1986 is choosing to rely on previously found operating costs. And from a landlord's perspective, you have to appreciate that if the previous case found for substantial operating costs, it's often to, to, to the landlord's advantage to say, fine, I'll select an updating I don't have to prove my operating costs. I don't have to get bills from the landlord. However, uh, lawyers or consultants acting for landlords would do well to analyze those costs to determine whether it's better to update costs or to, to proceed with, uh, w with uh, new costs. Another feature of the act is that a landlord may go to rent review and may claim capital expenses, and capital expenses as defined by rent review is a slightly different definition than you find in income tax, which, and I know that many of you will be familiar with income tax law. In rent review, a capital expenditure is defined in the regulations, but generally speaking, it's a major item of repair or replacement or addition or renovation the benefits of which are seen to accrue over an extended period of time over more than one accounting period. And if you will turn to page B, B4, you will note that the landlord has claimed three items of capital expenditures, garage renovation, storm windows, and appliances. And the, and the landlord not only has to prove these costs, and we're assuming here that all documents have been made, the landlord not only has to prove this cost, he also has to demonstrate how he financed them, because rent review allows for capital expenditures based on taking the item which in this, for example, the, the appliances of $325,000, and they're amortized over 
a number of years. In this case, Regulation 44087 under the Act calls for an amortization of 10 years. And they're amortized with interest. And so it's important that the landlord demonstrates what interest costs he incurred. And you'll see that in Section 2 on page B4, the landlord demonstrates that indeed he borrowed money from Trusco and the rate was, is prime plus, plus one and that it's an open kind of, of uh, financing. He also indicates that there was a guarantee given which led to a reduction from, from prime plus two. Again, that's important. The legislation and the, and the regulations allow for the Minister of Housing or the Hearings Board to take into account the fact that a landlord may have borrowed money at a lower rate of interest than otherwise would have been obtained because he has had uh, give, he has given additional guarantees. And throughout this section, the details are given for the capital expenditures, including the fact that there was management and supervision done. We'll see that on page B5 because again, the legislation permits the minister to take into account not only the actual cost of the work and the interest rate, but also to impute a management and administrative allowance, which compensates the landlord for his time and effort in carrying out the expenses. I just want to look briefly on page B1, which we haven't touched on, because page Page B1 shows some core information which the items I've given you all, all relate to. For example, there's the, account, there's, there, there's the accounting periods used. The base year accounting period ends in December of 87, projected year in December of 88. So those are the two periods which Rent Review is looking on. You're also told that the gross potential rent in the complex is $2 million approximately. Now that's not the revenue for a year, but that's the annualized revenue for the month before the application. And a number of items are based on that. We have discussed financial loss. The financial loss is calculated as a percentage of the gross potential rent. Rent review allows for an operating allowance. The operating allowance is calculated as a percentage of the gross potential rent. And of course, if the Minister of Housing finds that some of the rents are unlawful, this item would change. I'd ask you to go over briefly to page B12 and B13. Previously, we've discussed the financial loss, and here the revenue of the building is, is shown because the Minister of Housing takes this revenue, subtracts it from the operating costs, and further subtracts it fr from the financing to, to, to work out the financial loss. The section below, dealing with interest, this is item five on page B12, interest paid after August 85, that section is going to be, I think, increasingly important in rent review because it's where a landlord acquires a building, there are cash deficits, and he says, I have to, for a number of years, if the minister won't give me more than 5% each year on account of my loss, no matter how horrendous my loss is, I have to pay for these losses, either through our other borrowings or through other cash flow. Well, if he, if he pays for it through surp surplus cash flow in other areas of endeavor, uh, God bless him, because the Minister of Housing won't. Because if he does that, he, he has not paid interest within the meaning of the Act and the regulations, and he has simply subsidized the losses in the building. However, if he sets up a loan account, uh, more typically an overdraft account, where he draws down funds uh, gradually to pay for his financial losses, then the interest on those losses paid after August 85, which is the example here, are allowed to enter the rent increase calculation. 
the example we have used is a pre-1976 building, and so it's eligible for what's called relief of hardship under the Act, and that's pa page B13. And page B13 simply states basic revenue data, and what the Minister of Housing does with that is take that information and decide at some point in time whether or not the, the landlord's revenue exceeds 2% of costs. And, and if the landlord's revenue does not exceed 2% of costs, then the Minister of Housing is empowered under the Act to make an allowance for relief of hardship. That section, that section is proclaimed. What's not proclaimed is chronically depressed rents, different completely. Um, I'm sorry. The, uh, th this section, in effect, is a minuscule rate of return which the minister allows to pre-1976 buildings, but for political reasons, it's not couched in, in terms of a rate of return, but rather a relief of hardship. Finally, on the last page, you'll see two things. First of all, that's page B14. The landlord in this case is requesting partial equalization of rents. You'll recall, most of you, I think, that in 1982, when there was much hullabaloo about r rent review, and the minister brought in restraint legislation, one of the things which was suspended was the ability of rent review authorities to differentiate amongst different rent, uh, types of rental units when awarding increases. From 1982 to 1987, the Minister of Housing, or his predecessor, the Residential Tenancy Commission, was only able to allow rent increases on a straight, across-the-board, uniform percentage uh, uh, method. It's now possible under this Act to try and achieve parity uh, amongst units of equal type, subject to an absolute 5% limit w w within the law. It's sort of the pay equity of rent review but I'm sure Richard Fink would disagree on that point. Finally, uh, something near and dear to my heart, uh, rent review consultants re re report their fees under what's called other issues. You should know that if you are acting in the role of a consultant to, uh, to a landlord going to rent review, that the Ministry of Housing puts rather uh, stringent limits on the fees which may be, be recognized, but in any event, there is some uh, token allowance. Thank you. John will be uh, back for one last uh, kick at this uh, after I, I make him very angry with my remarks. Uh, you might just uh, note that in Section J of these materials, there's a checklist that John has prepared uh, for landlords uh, soliciting information in preparation for the materials. Uh, so I think uh, that's going to be uh, very helpful uh, to you, uh, should you be acting for landlords or tenants. Uh, tenants are going to uh, phone you up on the telephone. They're going to say, uh, we've got wind of a rent increase. We think we're having a rent increase over the statutory limit. Uh, will you represent us? Uh, you say, certainly, quote your fee, uh, they hang up, call me. Uh, <laughs> uh, the first question you, you've got for them is, uh, have you got your application yet? And the answer always is, what's an application? Uh, because they get so many forms these days from landlords that they can't figure it out. Page 109 of my uh, statute and regulations has a copy of the form. I, I hope your little red book has the same numbering system. I, I think it does. That's an application. Uh, the next question I have for the people phoning up is, has the Rent Review Commission told you that you have a, a date that you must file your materials? Because remember what happens now under the uh, system is, when the landlord files his application, at the same time he's supposed to file the cost revenue statement and all his supporting materials. And at some point when Rent Review turns his attention to your building, probably about nine months after the landlord has filed his application, uh, they're going to send to your clients, each of them, a note in writing stating uh, you've got such and such a date to file the materials. And this is your reply to an administrative process because there's no hearing here, it's administrative process. So assuming the tenants say, well, we haven't heard 
or we've got until May the 20th or something or other, then your job is to get the materials the landlord has filed with the, with the uh, rent review services. And you should phone them and write them. In other words, phone them and write them and say, I want all of the materials the landlord uh, has filed. Now, rent review has a fax machine, but they don't like the public using their fax machine. Think all the way through this. You have to remember we're dealing with the government here. So write them. Now, it's not enough just to write them and say, send me the landlord's application. Because if the landlord and the commission or the rent review services have already had 20 pieces of correspondence passing between them, the rent review won't send you that material because that's not part of his application. So what I always do is I say, send me every single piece of paper in the file. That's about as clear as I can get. Don't leave anything out. Send it all to me. Uh, and they generally will, and you'll get in a few days. Uh, there's a photocopy fee. You have to send the courier there with the money. Courier comes back with the material because after 12 years, rent review services still doesn't trust me to pay my bills. Uh, so you'll get all these materials, and then you have to start uh, to analyze them. And the first thing in analyzing them is to start with the cost revenue statement because really it's the skeleton of the landlord's application. I like to read it over once quickly. And there's, I have this attitude when I first get these things of sort of, oh no, here we go again, another John Andrade guaranteed 15% rent increase for the landlord. That's a bad attitude to take. The proper attitude to take is those capitalist landlords are trying to rip off my poor working class tenants again using that henchman John Andrade. Because you need, you need a cynicism in order to deal with the cost revenue statement. And let me, let me demonstrate. Take the first page, the address. Now the, 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 there's a cost revenue statement for this page, B1. The, the address looks fairly straightforward. I mean, why would you spend any time with the address? Well, the point is, if the landlord, for some typographical reason, uh, or that the management office is in one place and the building's in another, they have two municipal addresses, if he's missed the address, you can jump on it. If the landlord can't get his address right, how's he going to get the rest of the cost right? Take a look at item number three. It's about a third of the page down. The, the, there's a question there. It says, date first rental unit occupied. That's the form. And John's filled in pre-1976. From now on, when anyone asks me my age, I'm going to say pre-1976. <laughs> I mean, the rent, commission, the rent review services ask this question. They just don't know. They, they want to know more than it's pre-1976 because that's before and after rent review. Uh, the date of the building is interesting because if the building needs $10 million worth of capital repairs, it would be nice to know when it was built uh, in order to make a determination what's going on. So the point is, each particular line has to be very carefully examined and you have to be uh, paranoid that the landlord's out uh, to get you and, and is not giving you the straight goods on any line. Let's take a look at one particular item on uh, B4. These are the capital costs. The first item there is garage, $770,000. And, and the question is, that I always like to ask myself right away is, if the landlord got all of this cost, in other words, the rent review accepted $770,000 and it went into the rents, how much would that translate in a rent increase? Because I want to know how much money we're talking about in terms of rent increase for the tenants on this particular item. It sets some context to the item. And the way to roughly figure it out is as follows. If the landlord had to borrow $770,000 from the bank and he took out an amortization period of 10 years, and you'll see if you go across the column garage under anticipated useful life, it's 10 years, uh, which is set by the guidelines. If it's 10 years, borrowed $770,000, paying prime plus one today or prime plus two or whatever, how much does that account for in monthly payments if you had to borrow it from the bank yourself? How much monthly payments does it come to? And let's say for argument's sake it came to $90,000 a year or monthly payments of about uh, $7,500 uh, per month. Then given that the landlord's total revenue is $1,800,000, and given that each year, if you had to borrow this money, it's going to be $90,000, you can see that the rent increase is $90,000 over $1,080,000 
which I think if my mathematics holds up is a 5% rent increase. So in other words, the landlord's coming to rent review, he's starting from zero, he's now getting 5% for the garage, he gets an automatic 3.7% for showing his face, that's for his operating costs, uh, general operating costs, uh, utilities, uh, superintendent, etc. So he gets that 3.7 plus 5, he's now up to 8.7. Just on these two items, he's up to 8.7, and he's justified more than the statutory increase of 4.7. Now the next thing to do is, given we're talking a lot of money here, this is going to be one of the key parts of the application, we've got to go through the item and, and question each of its individual components. The first thing is garage. Is there a garage in the building? Uh, who's in the garage? Is it commercial tenants using the garage? In other words, people coming from out of the building who like to park at uh, St. Clair and, uh, and, and Young Street and are using the garage, or is it the tenants using the garage? Uh, so there's some first questions you want to ask. The next question is, what's the starting date and the completion date? If the garage isn't yet completed, if the garage is in midstream, there's an argument in the act that says an uh, item has to be substantially completed. Now in the, my materials in reply, and you'll see them uh, in section C, where I've, where I've written up materials, I've challenged the substantial completion. And in other materials I've written, I've given where, how you can find out what substantial completion is. And what I'm going to try and do is just point out to you three areas of where you can find out what stamp substantial completion is. The first area is the regulations. Now, Rent Review has got 100 pages of act, but that wasn't enough. Uh, what they also did was is made in very small print another uh, 50 or 60 pages of regulations. And the ones that I'm interested in are, there's three sets of regulations. The ones I'm interested in are, are right at the back of the book in small print. Well, they're not right at the back. Here, I'll give you a page number. It's 128. They start at 123. And on page 128 of my, materi of, uh, my uh, statute, uh, section 16 of regulation 440 slash 87 says, in this section, substantial completion means the degree of completion such that the landlord would be liable for the total cost of completion. So, yes. Yes, that's in the red book. Your red book doesn't have that? Oh, I apologize that you didn't get the regs. Uh, if you're going to do this type of law, get this blue book, get the regs, because you're going to need the regs, obviously. Let me just take a look in this giant blue book. Maybe we got the regs in here. No, didn't get just the guidelines. Okay. Well, why don't you have a turn on this guideline, section 8.5. Let me just get my page reference here. Section 8.5. These guidelines, section 8.5 is somewhere about a third of the way through. They're not the easiest thing to follow. You can speak to David Burnside and company about that later. And then you'll see if you find section 8.5, which is down on the bottom of the page, the reference. Uh, you'll see the page numbers. It says page so-and-so of 42, and I'd like you to turn to page 5 of 42. Now, an interesting question is, how can you follow these guides, these guidelines? I mean, how did I find page 5 of, page, of 42? And the answer is, I spent about five hours one day looking for it. But a quick way is, these guidelines seem to follow the regulations. So as the regulations move from 1 to 50, you want to follow the guidelines. The guidelines more or less move chronologically with the regulations. That seems to be what the author had in mind but didn't tell anybody. Uh, so you need the regulations. I'm sorry they didn't get reproduced. I, I assume they would. And you need the guideline. And you'll see there cost substantial completion means the landlord's liable. And they give you a little example uh, of, of what it would be. And then there's other areas of substantial completion. In my, somewhere in my materials, you're going to find uh, from a textbook on uh, litigation, construction, lien li construction litigation. There's an abstract from a textbook on what substantial completion means. And then there's the Construction Lien Act. It gives a definition of substantial completion. So that you have various types of references to what substantial completion means. Because it's obviously going to be a very 
uh, a term that's going to require some imagination. It's going to be a term that's going to be subject to some subjective views on the part of rent review. Is the garage substantially complete when all they're doing is putting on the final surfacing? Is it substantially complete when they've got 90% of it done? Uh, is it substantially complete when they've signed bonded contracts and they have 60% of it done? Uh, these are the questions that are obviously going to be important because if it's not substantially complete, the landlord, of course, doesn't get the cost. Tenants have saved 5%. Next question is always price, $770,000. I always have a tenants meeting, meeting with the tenants. I call, I tell the tenants, look, we've got the materials, get a church, get a school, let's meet together. And I want to do two things at that meeting. First of all, I want to give a political speech on why this legislation stinks and why the tenants shouldn't vote for the Liberals. For nine years I went around saying why they shouldn't vote for the Tories, now I'll say why they shouldn't vote for the Liberals because I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. I'm coming and telling them they're going to get a 5% rent increase for the garage. 3.7% because the landlord showed up, and, and they're ready to take my head off. So I say, look, don't blame me, fellas. I'm just here to lower the increase. You want to put the blame that's the fellow sitting at Queen's Park. So that's number one. Number two is $770,000 for the garage. If you know something about this garage work, if you've ever been in a building where you've seen it done, and I'm sure you've been in one building or another where you've seen the, you know, taking out all the concrete in the garage and drilling and stuff, You'll see it's mostly a man hours type of operation. In other words, you have a lot of men doing a lot of drilling, and it's a man hours type of thing. And what you want to know from the tenants when you meet with them is you've got some questions for them. One of the questions is, how many man hours were involved in doing this work? And there's always someone who's home during the day who sits and watches this stuff and probably gets <laughs> lung disease from watching it, and he'll be able to tell you that they had 10 men there for a few weeks, then they had three men there for a couple weeks, and you can't get an exact fix, but you can get an approximation of the man hours. And if you figure, so let's say the care $770,000, and let's say it's $650,000 is labor. Just, I'm telling you, it's, figures are often roughly like that. So what you're looking for is at $20 an hour, $25 an hour, whatever they're charging out, could you come up roughly to $660,000? Because if your figure from your tenant's evidence is falling a lot short of that, you start to smell a rat. Something's wrong. I'll give you another example, roof. If they've spent thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 fixing a roof, there has to be scaffolding going up a large building. I mean, unless you can just sort of take a wheelbarrow up the side of a, of a mountain and put it on the uh, roof, there has to be scaffolding on the building to do a large roof repair because you've got to get all this tar up there. So you ask the tenants, did you see scaffolding? Uh, you might ask them how many men were working on the roof, how, many, how long did it take? Again, you're trying to get some estimate. If the estimate falls a lot low as to what you're calculating, then you're going to need an engineer or a quality surveyor to come along and give you an estimate as to what he thinks in terms of dollars it's been done. Now, if he comes along and says, I think it was $710,000 and you've got $770,000, you're probably going to be out of luck. Because the landlord has discretion to take the highest contract, the lowest contract, etc. What you're looking at is, are we roughly in the same ballpark? That's the real question. The next item here is on item two on the cost revenue statement B4 is the guarantee. The landlord says, uh, I'm paying interest on this loan. Maybe we have to figure out the interest rate to figure out the monthly payments. He says, I'm paying interest uh, on this loan. Uh, I want to be paid for my interest factor because I gave this guarantee. Well, any landlord that owns a building where there's an individual, maybe a company owns a building where there's an individual involved, we're not talking Cadillac Fairview, where Jack Diamond would give a guarantee. We're talking about this particular landlord, he gives a guarantee, they have to give guarantees. There, there's no question about it. If the bank can get a guarantee to secure its loan, a substantial loan, they're going to ask for it. When the landlord says, I, I gave this guarantee, this reduced my interest rate, uh, this is just a section of the act added by John Andrade when he was on the advisory committee to get extra rent increases out of tenants. They have to give these guarantees. The fact that interest is reduced by the guarantees, I've done 10 of these applications with guarantees, and not once have I seen a letter from the bank saying, this interest rate would have been 13, that we gave a, took a guarantee, it's today 12. What they'll write is, we gave a guarantee, we like a guarantee, it could have been 15, it could have been 11, it could have been 12, we don't know, but we like a guarantee and that's the interest rate. You know, 
It's a, it's, it's dumb. It's a ripoff, and that's what it is. And the tune has to be called to both the tenants you're seeing, tell them what's going on, and to the commission. They have to keep badgering the commission. It's a ripoff. It's a ripoff. It's a ripoff. Sooner or later, someone might hear they'll amend the legislation, or they'll be uh, tougher with the landlords in proving these guarantees. So this is, this is the uh, one, one of the items. The final item in uh, capital costs uh, is the landlord supervise the work. Take garage repairs. Joe Landlord, unless he's a, an engineer, he can't supervise this work. The landlords hire consulting firms such as Trove, engineers who did the Gardner Expressway. They supervise the work. The landlord, what's he do? He gets the contract. He looks it over. He discusses with the engineers. Yes, the garage is falling down. Your building will fall down three years from now if you don't do something. He thinks about it for a while, speaks to the bank, gets a guarantee. Then he goes and gets the contract signed, does the work. This is called supervision. The landlord probably spent four hours doing it. He gets 7.5% of the capital cost. So if the capital cost is $770,000, he gets 7.5% added to that. So let's say 7.5% of $770,000 is roughly $60,000. $60, excuse me. So instead of the capital cost being worth $770,000, it's now worth $830,000 because the landlord supervised the work. You have to add a supervision cost into the cost of the repair. So now he's got $60,000 for four hours worth of work. That's $15,000 per hour, even higher than my fees. And this is being added in. And you see the, they fixed the roof, I supervised it. I supervised the roof repair. They're sitting in their Jaguars watching the roof. They're supervising it. You know, ridiculous. And so far, Rent Review has allowed the supervision allowance 99.9% .9 of the time on my initial decisions. He supervised the pipes, he supervised the roof. He must have been at the building every day and the tenants haven't seen him for six years, but he supervised. So, you know, cynicism is what you need here. Combativeness is what you need. Don't take anything at all for granted in this application. Now I'm gonna turn it back to John Andrade. He's gonna tell you how bona fide all this is. Uh, there's some uh, section here that says, did you supervise? I think it's on the next page, B5. Uh, okay, I, I'd like to conduct this thing in a sort of give and take, but time constraints and the number of audience and the microphones we can't. So if you've got questions, feel free, write them down. We'll have the break in about uh, 35 odd minutes and I'd be happy to answer them. But if you just want to look at page Item number three on B5, you'll see management administration. It says, uh, did you supervise? And he lists the three items and he says, yes, uh, they're not in our uh, media control, but we supervise them. Client says, we got a cheaper price, etc. But let me give it back to John, because remember in this procedure, Andrade goes first, he does the cost revenue statement, I reply, I do a written reply, and then John, in his written reply to my replies in these materials, he does the written reply back again. Notwithstanding, I'm mad at you now, John. I'll give you the split. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Let me get out of here. Something which, which uh, Richard has highlighted, and I think it's true, Range Review is going to be focused extensively in the next three, four, five years on capital expenditures, because many of you will probably uh, have seen or are aware of a number of studies coming down from CMHC dealing with uh, the need for uh, large-scale restoration of the housing stock. And most landlords, contrary to what uh, Mr. Ray says about uh, quick, quick flip artists, most landlords who have buildings want to keep them. They have no intention of selling them and uh, the tax laws certainly don't encourage sales. So for the vast majority of the housing stock, you will see, I think, in the next number of years, a, a, a pretty large volume of applications to rent review for a, for a restoration of the stock. Let me, first of all, with, a, with the capital, because it's something you should look at. In handling a rent, a rent review application, including capital expenditures, Someone acting for a landlord has to cover a number of bases. Timing is important. Y you want to make sure that the work is underway before you apply, contracts are in place, 
to meet some of the criticisms which Richard brought up, you want to make sure the contract is as detailed as possible. Now, you don't want to create self-serving evidence by producing a contract which looks totally unlike any other contract in the construction industry. But you have to bear in mind when advising your client, and really the time to be involved is not when he's finished the work and he comes to you and says, I need a rent increase. It's to encourage people who own buildings to retain you in advance so you can help them plan the whole strategy. But you want to have it clear in the contract what's being done, when it's to be done, what's the cost. Is it a rate contract? Is it a fixed price contract? You, you want to make sure the work is well uh, underway at the time of applications. Right now we're in a twilight area. Right now at Rent Review they're so backlogged a landlord could probably apply to Rent Review having just signed the contracts and start the work the very next day. Because and by the time they get around to, to this application in 1993, the work will be long finished, it will be paid for, and the landlord may have gone bankrupt. But notwithstanding that, it's important to keep things in a proper sequence. You also want to make sure that the work is completed just about when the rent review administrator is about ready to make his decision. Because you want to be clear that substantial compliance, substantial com completion is met as defined in the regulations. And you, you can read the words when you get copies of the blue book, but if you, if you look at it, it really means it's that point at which the work has gone so far, it's not credible to believe it could be terminated in midstream, and where the landlord is really liable to pay the whole shot. And that in a nutshell, is what substantial completion means, in my view, under these regs. So to, to meet the kind of criticisms which, uh, which Richard will bring up, you want to make sure that the timing of that date is going to be in advance of when the minister makes his decision. Now, if it's not, all isn't lost. Because under the Act, the hearings board is entitled to look at, I would say obliged to look at, properly filed material before it, which really reflects subsequent events or evidence which was not before the minister. So there was a strike in the siding industry and the windows, to take an example, don't get done. All isn't lost. You may be turned down by the minister saying the work isn't complete. And, you, and we'll talk about this la uh, later on today when we have the mock trial. But you'll see that it's possible on appeal to resurrect claims which were denied because through the passage of time they have been, been completed. Uh, it's also important, just to, just to remain on capital for a second, that when you get the, these letters from the bank, uh, they should be clear. It should be clear and it should be arranged before your client walks into the bank. He should check with the banks and say, Give me letters as to what you would charge me if I borrow the money with no guarantee. The only security you have is the building. Now, some banks will say, well, the building is already 95% financed. We, we wouldn't lend you one penny on the basis of the security of the building alone. So then you may say, fine, but were it not 95% financed, had it only been 50% financed, what would you have charged me to lend me this, these funds strictly on the security of the building. And you get that in writing, and then you make it quite clear in your paperwork that the rate has been reduced, as in the, as in the case here, by 1%, or is 3%, uh, whatever the case may be, it's clearly documented. Because where I have to agree with Richard is that as time passes on, if landlords, their consultants, their lawyers, their accountants go to rent review, and they really can't quantify in a credible fashion the savings which has been achieved, then really it will be uh, not allowed and there will be no discount permitted and they will recognize the actual rate of interest and they won't recognize the guarantee. One last item, management and supervision. Here Richard and I ha have a fundamental disagreement. 
If you look at the reg, it refers to management and supervision of the capital expense. And I think you will agree with me when you see it that the wording of the reg is not suggestive of technical supervision. What, in my view, they're talking about is not the fact that trowel or construction control or somebody else says, well, the concrete is uh, nine points secure and the drying time has passed, but rather they're talking about how do you manage the project facing the reality that people live there, they want hot water in the mornings, they want to use the garage. And I'll tell you how a client of mine, in my view, managed a garage project. He did this during the summer, deliberately, when schools were out. He rented from the Board of Ed a school parking lot. He hired car jockeys to meet. This is coming up soon, Richard. They're going to retain you, I know. <laughs> he, they, they, they hired car jockeys to shuffle the cars from the front door over to the school parking lot. In the mornings, the cars were lined up just like a Queen's Park, except it was just Toyotas, not Cadillacs. And he made sure that the work was done in a proper sequence. The painting wasn't done before the plumbing. The plumbing was done, then the plastering, then the painting. He coordinated, he was in effect a general contractor. He coordinated how the work was done, which came first, which, which supplier really gave the best prices. Of course, he had engineers involved. He may have had a quantity surveyor involved. But these people provided expert input. Now, I'll agree with Richard to the point that it is important that a landlord be able to demonstrate precisely what he has done. And so despite all the numbers, I think in the final analysis, it really does come back to your field. It comes back to marshalling evidence. And whether you do it on your own, or in conjunction with a consultant, it's important to demonstrate evidence and to, de and to demonstrate costs. Thank you. They can hear you without that, Richard. I'm sure they can. Uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Carol Renecki. Uh, Mr. Renecki is uh, trained and qualified as a solicitor in Poland and he has been a rent review commissioner and now manager of uh, rent review uh, services since 1983 and I lead you to draw your own conclusions about that connection. The uh, rent review as you know is divided into geographical units so that each geographical unit such as Scarborough, Etobicoke, they have their own individual office and Mr. Renecki is in charge of the Etobicoke office. And essentially what happens is the parties make their uh, submissions and Mr. Renecki and his or his staff uh, acting as the administrator under Minister's Fiat uh, make a decision. And if you turn to item E in the materials, you'll see his order on John Andrade's application. And Mr. Renecki is going to be speaking about the procedure uh, and the substance of uh, drafting those orders. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I just wanted to clear this up. Uh, people do not get to rent review because they were solicitors in Poland. Uh, people get to rent review because they like rent review. Um, if you would like to um, make an application representing a landlord or a tenant uh, to uh, the Minister of Housing, you can't go to 777 Bay uh, Street, uh, 10th floor but you should go to one of the offices which are known as the Rent Review Services. Not the Rental uh, Review Board, not the Landlord and Tenant Act Board, uh, but Rent Review uh, Services. There is still uh, 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 an organization known as the Residential Tenancy Commission, uh, which was the previous uh, body administering the Rent Review laws in Ontario, uh, but uh, uh, they are uh, in existence only for the purpose of clearing up uh, the old uh, business. Any application for rent review that was made uh, after January 1st, 1987, when the act was proclaimed, uh, had to be made into one of the 21 offices, and I, with pleasure, represent the Etobicoke and City of York uh, office of uh, uh, the ministry. 
I'm uh, somewhat disappointed uh, in the fact that uh, you received the copy of the cost revenue statement, uh, certainly the most important uh, materially document in the process of obtaining an increase higher than the, uh, than the yearly guideline, but what, uh, what, an, what an applicant represented or unrepresented should also bring to us at least 90 days before the first increase, he wants to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, increase the rents above the guideline, is also an application, a copy of which has to be served on the tenants within 10 days. In our jargon, we call this uh, particular form uh, a Form 4, and uh, in the French version, I don't know why everybody got a French version of the Act, you will probably uh, find this uh, form there. Uh, and uh, an applicant also should bring to us the list of current and proposed rents. Re list of current and proposed rents, list the rents as they are currently with the last date of increase, and in, in, in another column uh, also rent, uh, lists rents that the landlord would like to have for each individual uh, unit. This list should be available to the tenants, and on the copy of the application which the tenants should receive, there is a box which stipulates that the copy of the list of current and proposed rents is available to tenants between our so-and-so at a certain address. And of course then comes the cost revenue statement together with all the supporting documentation and section 74 of the Act is quite clear on this, that the application should be made together with all the supporting documentation at least 90 days. So if you are approached by a client uh, uh, who says, you know, I would like to increase my rents from uh, August 1st, uh, and he hasn't even uh, tried to collect all his papers, uh, I suggest to you that uh, it could be very difficult to not only to, uh, to make the proper calculations and write the cost revenue statement, but also to gather all the evidence. Uh, uh, give yourselves, I suggest, uh, at least a month or two in order to, uh, to uh, uh, provide for all this necessary documentation. Now, please bear in mind, unlike the previous system that existed between the years 1980 and 1986, the new system uh, does not rely on a uh, semi-judicial public hearings held by commissioners uh, at uh, both the first and the appeal levels. Uh, at the first level now, it is an administrative process and it is a process in which paper and paper evidence becomes most important. Uh, it is a process which, uh, in which uh, the uh, ability of an administrator, wherever the Act mentions the word minister does this or minister di does that, it's actually an administrator in one of the offices who is the delegate of the minister and who received the power to, to issue decisions under this uh, legislation. Uh, and the administrator is the person who not only gathers the evidence, but also analyzes the evidence and then uh, um, provides, the, uh, provides the decision uh, also uh, on paper. It's not a verbal decision, it's a decision which we call an order that is sent to all the parties and is, uh, it, is, uh, it is given in writing. Uh, so the process currently is very much based and uh, run by uh, evidence uh, uh, given uh, uh, in, in documents. So gathering this evidence and uh, and uh, the ability of the landlord to provide the evidence is, uh, is uh, extremely important. And the, one of the things that we are still finding out after 14 months of the existence of the, of the process is that parties, be it landlords or tenants, are continually surprised that they have to submit things in writing. Uh, and uh, since they are, since they are uh, uh, not meeting the deadlines because of this. They have to ask again for extension of time to, uh, to uh, uh, submit this or other piece of evidence. And then we have to respond to the extension of time request, uh, notifying uh, the landlord and sometimes as many as three or 400 tenants that uh, this particular piece of evidence was either admitted or not admitted uh, to, uh, the, uh, to the evidence because the deadline has uh, long uh, passed. So paper is very important, although the Act allows us to take evidence in, uh, uh, verbally, uh, by telephone, or from a party that sits across uh, the table from an administrator. 
Uh, however, in our administrative uh, uh, practice, we urge parties to write to us rather than leave uh, things uh, uh, verbally. Landlords are not uh, really uh, 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 very prone to, to say things to us. It's the tenants who would come, they see someone who represents rent review services and they would like to explain to us that this or the other item in the landlord's application is, uh, shouldn't be allowed. We tell them, sir, we've got so many applications that whatever you tell me today would not most probably remain on the file, even if I make a, even if I make a note, please make this in writing. Uh, unfortunately, that's the stage or that's the step that many people wouldn't like, many tenants wouldn't like to, uh, uh, to take. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, I, I, I can see reluctance because they wouldn't like to leave the address and the name uh, and the apartment number on the file. They say, well, what's going to happen to me? Uh, Mr. Fink uh, was uh, uh, so kind and left me with a list of questions, uh, uh, suggested questions that he would like me to touch on. Uh, uh, rather than go through the stages of the process, perhaps I will clarify these questions probably at the same time answering some of the, uh, uh, of the uh, <coughs> stages of process questions. First question, are rent review applications uh, passed to support staff of rent review services for comment? Um, they are not passed for comment. They are, first of all, set up uh, in two files. One is a working file and one is a public file. Uh, the working file is always with the administrator or one of his assistants, and the, uh, the public file is available to the public, both the applicant landlord and the, any of the tenants who come in. Anybody, can, uh, uh, anybody who is a party to the application can, uh, can ask uh, for a file and uh, receive a file, although we ask uh, the party to sign a sheet uh, specifying who or uh, who he or she is and, uh, and whether he or she is a, a tenant. Sometimes we, are, we ask for identification. Uh, there's a new constraint in, uh, in our ability to give away files uh, that were submitted to us by landlords, and this uh, constraint is the Freedom of Information and Protection and Privacy Act that, uh, on the one hand, does not allow us to give any information that would be uh, um, of personal nature, but on the other hand obliges us to, uh, to, to uh, provide access to the parties, uh, uh, to, to someone who is not a party, to all of our uh, files that we have. Uh, it's then uh, the job of the, of the manager of the office to look through the file and, uh, and look at the request of uh, a non-party uh, for viewing the application. Uh, the support staff, uh, uh, which Mr. Fink uh, probably meant, are the assistants. They work with the administrator. And uh, in the Etobicoke office, there are four administrators, that is, four uh, individuals who have the minister's power of issuing orders, and uh, six uh, assistants who assist them in, uh, in working up the files. Yes, it is the assistants who immediately after the, after the application is made, if an application is made today, probably in a week's time when it's set, into files, uh, it will uh, be reviewed by an assistant and brought to the, to the administrator with comments, saying, for example, the landlord is asking for increases in 1989, but he's using 86 and 87 as his, as his, uh, as his uh, uh, periods of, uh, of review. Uh, what do we do about that? The landlord is uh, asking for financial loss, but is not, but is not submitting his uh, uh, op operating costs uh, documents. So, and then the administrator at this early stage tries to rectify these things by writing to landlord or by contacting landlord by phone uh, and saying, uh, you know, here are the weak points of your application. We'll be reviewing your application in a couple of months' time, but uh, if you could clear up these points now, uh, that would save uh, much confusion uh, later. Uh, are the guidelines binding on administrators? I believe that that's the question that uh, Mr. Dumaini would like to touch on during our little panel, uh, so I perhaps leave it at, to, to that time. Uh, is the management administrative allowance in capital costs automatic? How could one disprove this cost? Well, uh, the way I read section is it 13 of uh, the regulation is that, uh, 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 the, uh, that if there is evidence that uh, the landlord did not supervise at all, the landlord or one of his employees did not supervise at all any uh, uh, capital expenditures that he is uh, claiming, then I suppose that the administrator will uh, have to rule whether the allowance is there or not. 
so far uh, whether the allowance uh, should be uh, given or not. So far, we haven't really seen any uh, we haven't seen any points raised about uh, about the allowance. Perhaps because many tenants do not simply understand what it means, and that's uh, perhaps your role here in educating those tenants, explaining that they can be hit by even 15% uh, extra uh, on the capital expenditures if they uh, if they cannot disprove uh, that the landlord is, uh, uh, hasn't been uh, supervising them. Uh, the uh, the section 13 of the regulation, which uh, deals with uh, allowance for management and administration. Uh, is in my mind worded in such a way that uh, an administrator faced with the actual evidence could uh, not grant this uh, particular allowance uh, to a landlord uh, uh, asking for it. Uh, what's the sense of the regulations re rewarding landlords who borrow as opposed to landlords using their own funds? Well, the sense is actually the same as it was in the Residential Tenancies Act, the previous piece of legislation, that landlords should not be punished by the fact that they have more money than the other landlords. And uh, uh, if they use their funds uh, uh, in the buildings rather than invest them in some other means, uh, uh, give, them the, give them the interest uh, also. So in this sense, uh, uh, neither the logic nor the policy of Rendezvous hasn't changed since at least 1979. How can a landlord in a severe financial loss position use his own funds for capital repairs? What funds does uh, he have? Well, if we are finding that, uh, that, there is, that, the, that uh, the building is in financial loss, it does not necessarily mean that the landlord is in financial loss. We are looking at costs and revenues associated with this particular building, whether it's one unit or whether it's 1,000 units. The fact that the landlord owns other buildings and, uh, and that generally uh, you cannot talk about the landlord being, be, uh, suffering, uh, being in the red doesn't mean that the building isn't uh, in the red. And since we re relate costs and revenues and losses to the building and the tenants who live in the building, uh, then uh, uh, it doesn't really matter that the landlord is rich and has a, a, a villa in the Bahamas. Uh, why allow a consultant's fee when 50% of buildings have or already have a consultant's fee built into their rents? Uh, uh, well, first of all, uh, whatever, uh, whatever happened before January 1st, 1987 uh, with, in a particular building in terms of, uh, of rents being built up uh, uh, by rent review decisions doesn't really count apart from uh, the situation where you have a previous, where you have a previous uh, order and you are using the previous order's findings to substantiate operating costs. And with passage of time, this will, uh, this will be uh, uh, soon over. Uh, that the consultant's fees are already built into rents of, uh, of uh, many apartments in uh, Ontario uh, doesn't matter. We are looking at a current situation. Uh, the fact that there was an 82 order which built in a uh, consultant's fee at the rate of uh, $18 uh, a, a unit uh, per year uh, uh, has no bearing on the, on the present situation. Uh, are oral submissions of any use uh, on the part of tenants or landlords? We are obliged to take oral submissions. We are obliged to, uh, to uh, make every effort to note them, uh, however, uh, with the amount of work that we are facing, it would be self-defeating for both landlords and tenants to rely on them. If, uh, if we uh, receive a telephone call with an important piece of information about the roof that the landlord is supposed to have installed on the building, and we make a note, and the administrator will make a note to the file, uh, how much is it worth when faced with an invoice uh, which looks absolutely proper and says that the landlord did spend $30,000 on the roof. Uh, perhaps one way would be to write back to the caller and says, this is the gist of the information you gave me. Do you agree? Uh, documented uh, information is certainly uh, much better than any oral, uh, even if subsequently uh, uh, put on paper. If there are questions of legal interpretation and significance, can a landlord or tenant representative actually speak to the appropriate legal staff of the, of the commission? It's, uh, it's not of the commission, but of the ministry. I would suggest that if you have any questions uh, regarding interpretation of the act, 
and interpretation of the regulations that you should approach the manager of the given office uh, in writing and ask him or her to, uh, to uh, check with either legal uh, um, uh, uh, section or the policy section. We do it every day and we have solved many, many problems that, that, uh, that in a natural way arose out of a very complex act and even more complex uh, regulations. But I suggest that the manager of the given office is the, is the vehicle uh, to go through or the channel to go through. Are there, uh, are there any boundaries in what landlords can file in the opportunity to reply to the tenant's uh, submissions? Uh, a landlord makes uh, an application and submit, let's, let's suppose, 100% of all the documentation uh, necessary. And tenants come back with uh, representations which touch only on two of these areas. Uh, can a landlord then, in his response to the tenant submission, cover any additional territory or just the, just, the, uh, um, uh, just the territory touched on by the tenants. My uh, reading of, uh, of the act is that, uh, that at the time the, t the landlord responds to tenants' representations that he should limit himself only to the uh, topics raised in the, in the representations. Uh, uh, he can raise other issues, but in my mind an administrator will have to disregard whatever is raised uh, because it's not ra it wasn't raised in proper uh, time. He should have raised it together with all the documentation. If he wants to raise any other issues, he should ask, in my mind, for extension of time to make these submissions that should have been made originally together with the application. Uh, on tenant submissions, I'm very glad that Mr. Fink touches on the subject of tenants uh, calling uh, lawyers and saying, you know, we have this huge rent increase, what can we do? I would uh, ask you to go out and at least speak to those tenants, even if it's not a very profitable venture. Uh, why? Simply because there is lots of confusion on the minds of the tenants. Applications have very major issues. Applications have millions of dollars that the landlords are claiming. And tenants would come to us and say, there's no parking lot for me. Or they would say that my tap was leaking. Or that all winter I had very poor heating. These are issues that are important for Mr. X, who lives at apartment 203, but from the point of view of the, of the actual costs claimed, you know, they are totally uh, uh, unimportant. Uh, so we urge tenants uh, and we ask tenants to, to, to get together and uh, to find uh, uh, an accountant among themselves uh, who could uh, make some, uh, make some uh, significant uh, points on the applications. But uh, more often than not, if there is no organization of tenants in the building, uh, these, uh, these uh, representations are totally uh, uh, out, of, uh, out of the uh, subject of, of the application. What does the administrator do when the application is not, not properly documented? Well, 1987 was an unusual year because it was a year when the Act came into force and a year when uh, uh, the landlords and tenants uh, and the staff of the ministry uh, were all learning the, 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 the new system. So uh, uh, the, the obvious policy in this situation was to be uh, um, uh, perhaps lenient and, uh, and prepared to explain the Act and uh, help landlords and tenants uh, to understand what is required of them. As time passes on, uh, uh, so in this sense, uh, uh, we could point to a landlord saying, sir, you're asking for, uh, for uh, this particular uh, ground of an application, but it's not supported. Okay? Uh, as time passes on, uh, we would simply have to assume that uh, the level of understanding is going to be greater and this sort of temporary uh, uh, phase-in period is over. Uh, and we will be perhaps uh, more, uh, uh, more uh, sticky uh, uh, when it comes to, uh, to treating applications. We are still finding applications that haven't got the basic, basic documentations and the procedure, our internal min, uh, administrative procedure is to write to the landlord or to the tenant if it's a tenant's application and say, sir, you, uh, uh, you are supposed to submit this, you haven't sub submitted this, here is your deadline to make the submissions, and at the same time, please ask for extension of time. We first consider your extension of time request, 
uh, because you were supposed to submit it on March the 1st, and today is, uh, is April uh, the, the 11th. Uh, we'll first consider your extension of time request, and then we'll consider, uh, and then we'll tell you whether we'll accept your additional submission or not. Very often, landlords do not react to these letters. I uh, work in an office where the population of landlords is uh, 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 a small landlord, rather unsophisticated, and uh, and we have great problems with uh, with those uh, uh, landlords. Is it the administrator's role to improve a submission which has been improperly documented? Uh, no, it is not the administrator's role, but it is the administrator's duty to point to a landlord um, uh, uh, that, that things are missing and uh, how he can, uh, uh, how he can uh, uh, repair his application or improve his application. Uh, however, if we see that uh, a landlord is represented by, uh, by a, a consultant like Mr. Andrade, uh, uh, then uh, we would assume that, uh, that uh, this kind of a pointer is not uh, necessary and, uh, and uh, we would uh, simply disregard a given, uh, a given uh, uh, grant for an application if uh, there is no uh, proper uh, submissions uh, submitted together with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's uh, 10.30 now. We're running about 15 minutes behind. I thought maybe uh, with Bob's uh, permission uh, we could do our break now and then come back uh, to the uh, panel. Uh, so we'll break now. It's 10.25. Uh, we'll come back at uh, 20 minutes to 11. Thank you. If you have questions, put them down. We'll try and answer them as well. We uh, will spend the next um, half hour dealing with a uh, panel uh, chaired by me with John Andrade, Richard Fink, and, and Mr. Renecki. Uh, I thought sitting over there this morning that I'd walked into Poly Sci 1 when I heard Richard. So I thought instead of, uh, <laughs> instead of having rhetoric, we deal with reality for this portion of the program. <laughs> and that's the last time Richard invites me to anything. And uh, we've got Julius Melnitzer, who is always on the edge. About ready to fall off the right wing. Um, I want to bring you right up to date, first of all. If you turn to page N, as in Norman, 11 of the materials, That's a, a, a paper dealing with the infamous uh, suite hotel and apartment hotel issue, which we won't uh, uh, address directly here today. Uh, let me tell you, though, at the uh, bottom of the page in paragraph two, I made a prediction, which unhappily came true on the 5th of April, or one day after I submitted the paper. Uh, you, if you're interested in suite hotels, the suite hotel regulation is out. It's Ontario Regulation 184 for 1988. It continues the distinction between post-1976 and pre-1975 buildings. It sets out onerous tests, which in the pre-1975 buildings have to be met continuously from 1st December 1979. That date is the start of what I call the second generation rent regulation in Ontario, namely the Residential Tenancies Act. And for post-1975 housing stock, uh, the tests are the same as in the pre-76s, but need to be met only from the 1st of August 1985, or the first date upon which the unit became a suite hotel. Um, you should get them as soon as possible if you're advising clients in this field because there is a filing deadline of 1st June 1988 in order to justify the existence of a suite hotel unit from the inception of the current statute, which is 1st January 1987. So that's an update. My prediction in that paragraph unhappily came true. Now, I'd like to start off with a question for Mr. Uh, Renecki, the format we're going to follow is I'll ask a question of a particular panel member and then I will ask the other panelists for comments. And if necessary, uh, allow the first uh, person answering a, a right of reply. Mr. Renecki, we've heard uh, various numbers described for the backlog, that there is something in excess of 20,000 orders backlogged um, going back perhaps into 1986, 
Can you can you tell us the extent of the backlog and, and what the ministry is doing to uh, cope with it? The actual figure on the backlog is not known to me, but I would suppose that it hovers around 25,000. Uh, it gives us no pleasure. It uh, gives us many sleepless nights. And it's something that we are doing everything possible to, uh, uh, to uh, reduce. First of all, the reason uh, for this was that uh, when the act was born on January 1st, 1987, uh, it was a result of, what, 15, 16 months of uh, lots of activity. Uh, an activity that included uh, Landlord and Tenant Advisory Committee, on which Mr. Andrade uh, said, uh, activities which included uh, two uh, drafts, uh, two bills, uh, being uh, first being replaced by the, by the second. Uh, then uh, the legislative uh, stage with the uh, uh, legislature committee uh, traveling across the province. Uh, all of this, uh, I suppose, delayed uh, the process of, uh, of uh, starting the life of the Act uh, until January 1st, 1987. When the Act came in January uh, uh, into life, uh, uh, only a very rudimentary structure was uh, in existence, structure of a new system. Suddenly the Residential Tenancy Commission uh, was no longer there and everything had to be built from scratch, uh, from uh, uh, staff appointments and, uh, and uh, uh, job descriptions and, uh, uh, and hiring uh, everybody from the director to, uh, to the receptionists. Uh, uh, to writing regulations, uh, drafting, uh, drafting the, um, uh, drafting the forms, etc. Uh, additionally, we have started, uh, we have started the uh, 1987 with uh, an immediate backlog because the act, although it came into into life on, in January of 87, it uh, covered uh, the post 75 uh, buildings uh, back to uh, 1st August uh, 1985. So whatever increases were taken after August 1st, 1985 could, be, could then be justified by landlords who immediately used this chance and uh, the result of it is that at the Etobicoke office I'm holding about 2,000 applications, uh, 1,500 of which are for those post-75 uh, units. So I would say the three-fourths of, uh, of the backlog is due to the fact that uh, there's a, there was an ability to make retroactive applications. Richard. Under the current system, as was in the past, a landlord could apply for a, an order, say, to a Tobico office for more than guideline, but he's only entitled to collect guideline until the order comes out. We've, we've heard about the backlog. That means, it seems to me, that a number of tenants will be facing a, a huge uh, back rent uh, bill once the uh, order comes out. How are you advising your tenant clients? Well, I tell them they don't have to worry because if they leave it to me, all their problems will be solved. They won't have to pay more rent, no. <laughs> I, I tell them uh, to put money in the bank uh, if they plan to be in the building uh, because uh, also I can usually tell them roughly what to expect in the rent increase so they can uh, get some idea of how much to put in the bank uh, because if they don't, uh, in very short order, the landlord will be taking eviction action against them and they'll have to come up with the uh, money. So I, I advise them to keep the money in the bank. Uh, many of the tenants, however, are paying the full rent increase the landlord asked for because they don't understand the law and they're afraid. Uh, so it's a mixed bag. John, it's, uh, it's not unusual for landlords to make consecutive applications for uh, rent increase. Um, what information are you receiving from the ministry about a second application for rent increase while the first application is pending and no order has been made. Actually, Bob, that's quite timely. The ministry recently issued a series of sh information sheets called options for uh, sending out uh, to landlords as to how to complete uh, new applications or new notices of rent increase pending a preceding application not yet resolved. What the Ministry has sent out is very detailed, very convoluted, I think, with good intention. The problem is that throughout the piece, there are disclaimers saying this isn't really advice from the Ministry, we're not giving legal advice to anybody, we're simply saying here's something you may wish to consider. And uh, what's really disquieting is that throughout uh, these information sheets, they're saying, by the way, the one way you can really resolve this problem 
is not to give any notices of rent increase pending the resolution of the application. Now, as Carol Wernicke has just told you, uh, there's a substantial backlog. Uh, I know for a fact that the ministry uh, hasn't yet got its automated system going, but I hear it's nearing completion. So, uh, unfortunately, what the ministry is saying to the public, what they refer to as their client base, is uh, maybe you shouldn't be increasing rents until these things come out. Now, in the past, working along with, uh, with, with different uh, law firms, we were able to devise ways of uh, giving extra information on notices of rent increase and second a applications to make sure that tenants knew exactly what was going on, that in fact the previous application was not resolved, we had not been awarded the rent increase, but still we wanted to, to move forward. And that didn't seem to attract uh, too much wrath from uh, Richard Fink or Ken Hale or anybody else on the tenant side, provided we gave adequate adequate information and tried very hard not uh, to mislead. But what the ministry has issued, I'll tell you, would, would, would almost uh, scare a lot of small landlords into uh, simply uh, standing still while the ministry struggles on with its decisions. I, I gather what you're suggesting is that you're not going to follow that suggestion. And uh, you'll try to put something on the notice of rent increase uh, which will tell the tenant that there is an order pending and that the subsequent application is building on that. I, I think the key is you don't want to mislead the tenants into believing that you've already been awarded the previous application. Just, just let me pursue that for one minute. Mr. Renecki, have you seen any notices coming into the Etobicoke office using that technique? Yes, there's a little disclaimer saying uh, with, the, with the current maximum rent saying pending uh, the decision of the Ministry of Housing. Thank you. I thought I'd, uh, I'm trying to work these into the questions you, you put up. I thought I'd take one question at this point. Uh, the question is, when considering substantial capital improvements to a residential rental structure, is there any process whereby one can acquire pre-construction insurance that the rent will be permitted to be increased by the related regulatory amount? Uh, let me just answer that briefly. Yes, there is. There's a system called conditional orders. Uh, it's somewhat akin to a, an advanced binding ruling under the Income Tax Act. You can apply to the minister and say, Minister, I'm proposing to do these things, spend this money, and if I do that, what's the rent increase I, I'm likely going to get? The tenants have an opportunity to make submissions, and eventually a conditional order is issued. I anticipate, and we'll ask Mr. Renecki this in a moment, that the order will give you a time limit in which to do the work because you'll appreciate as, as someone explained this morning, John, I think, uh, rent increases driven by capital expenditures have an interest component in them. And I think the minister would not want to give you forever to do that uh, in case interest rates went down, and you wouldn't want uh, to be blocked from going back if interest rates changed. Once you've done the work, you go back to the minister, and in effect you say, listen, I did what I said I was going to do. May I please have my, my rent increase now? Uh, is that basically how the system is working? Yes, although uh, the two uh, conditional orders that we have so far issued in Etobicoke did not give any deadline for the landlord to either uh, to either finish the work or apply uh, with a regular uh, application, uh, the rate is given there. So uh, so any calculations would change as the result of the of the changing rate. Uh, no, no, not only the rate might change in the in the actual application, but also the the amount that you are considering on the conditional one might not be exactly the same. I think the point to be taken from that is you still want to move expeditiously so that that which you're predicting uh, will occur, rather than being exposed to the adjustments that Mr. Renecki mentioned. John, let me start you off with a with a question. Uh, what issues are you seeing uh, occurring with some regularity? Uh, in terms of tenant defenses to, to whole building review applications other than the ones uh, Richard's mentioned? Well, perhaps uh, the item which, which has come up so far, are tenants arguing as to cases in the post-75 sector dealing with, with economic loss? To give some background, most of the economic loss in the post-75 sector arises from syndications and MERB transactions. And a lot of these transactions involved substantial tax consideration. 
I've seen a number of submissions by tenants where they're saying, look, the price paid was really a tax device. Uh, there, there was one, the real price, plus there were, there were a whole bunch of add-ons, so the argument goes, uh, pre-paying or pre-selling uh, costs down the road, and these things uh, may have been recognized for income tax purposes, but they shouldn't be recognized at rent review. Uh, the reg, and I'm referring to regulation 44087 and regulation 9387 under the Act, suggests that in fact all these soft costs are part of acquisition costs. Now, I must tell you that in the operating guide issued by the Ministry, they have deviated, in my view, on a, in a number of areas. For example, if, uh, if a building had cash flow guarantees, the Ministry isn't allowing that. But the attack seems to be, I guess, to taken by the tenants, is that some of these costs and the acquisition costs are not real, that they shouldn't be recognized because they are really ta tax, income tax uh, costs and should be treated somewhat differently from rent review. Essentially they're saying strip out all the agreements and only allow the construction and land agreement. May I add a comment here, John? I think that for the audience it would be a good thing to explain what the significance under the Act of pre-75 uh, 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 and post-76. Uh, because we throw these uh, these words. I think and, we're going to do that with Julius. Okay. Well, let, let me just briefly really tell you that only post-1975 structures get a return on equity. Uh, the post-75 structure of the Act looks like a bit like a public utility, a bit like a rate-based rate of return system. Pre-76 is it's, it's the old what we called cost pass-through system, w in which the uh, impact on return on equity is purely a lottery. Uh, it, it, the Act just does not look at returns to the landlord. Let, let me just pursue John's comment, Mr. Inecki. Um, you've, you've had, there, there was some tax-driven construction in Etobicoke. Are you seeing many of these <coughs> MERB or tax-driven uh, applications coming in? Yes, uh, out of the 1,500 uh, uh, retroactive applications, I would say that the majority have this type of a construction there. And uh, we, uh, quite frankly, we're just only now looking at, uh, at them. Are, is, is the defense that... Uh, no, the tenants the tenant just do not, uh, do not uh, bring this as a defense. I haven't seen it yet. Richard, is that an area in which you're probing? Well, I know uh, Julius and I have a case on uh, that has uh, one of these MERPs, and uh, that defense uh, was raised uh, in spades. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm sure we'll get together yet on that case at the appeals uh, hearings. Let me uh, turn to you, Richard, a question of, of ethics in this respect. There is a system called equalization under this statute, and basically it, it's an attempt or a policy to say that similar accommodation should have similar rent. Uh, the problem is that given the history of rent regulation in this province since 1975, you could have two units side by side which were identical and have a, a massive variance in, in rent. Uh, the landlord can apply for equalization and the result of a successful application for equalization will mean that some tenants will receive higher rent increases than others. Now Richard, if you're acting for all of the tenants where some may receive more than others, and, and some obviously receive less, how do you cope with taking instructions? You've got a conflict right within your, your client group. Well, there's the, being retained by the tenants is somewhat trickier than by the landlords because, uh, in, in essence, uh, I'm being retained by a number of individuals, and of course the individuals who have the low rents, uh, say their one-bedroom apartment costs 350, uh, they're not going to want equalization, whereas the tenant living directly above them whose one-bedroom apartment's coming in at 400, uh, does want equalization so that uh, he'll have a lower than uh, average rent increase. Uh, the the res resolution of the dilemma is, is that uh, I get retained by one person. That is the chairman of the Tenants Association. My dealing is with the one person. So my instructions, although we take them at tenants' meetings, I take them over the phone, etc., uh, are really coming from one person. And what the tenants do is, is uh, they discuss it and come to a, a, a majority opinion on what tact 
uh, I should take on equalization. Usually it's a compromise, saying we'll agree to some equalization but not full equalization, which the Act allows for to a certain extent. And uh, that's the tax I take, and it's on the instructions of the tenants who uh, paid my bills. Um, that's fair. Uh, Mr. Renecki, it was my, my, my sense under the Residential Tenancies Act that the Residential Tenancy Commission had a, a strong policy um, bias, if you will, in favor of equalization. Has that sense carried through into the, the ministry and to the administrator's level? Yes, we would like we would like to see equalization being introduced, uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> many landlords would like to see that too. Uh, one of the complaints of tenants uh, that we face uh, is, uh, you know, how come my apartment is more expensive than an identical apartment above me, and uh, and uh, very often tenants take this to mean that they are paying illegal rent, and there are tenants applications for rebate based only on the on the on this uh, base that. Uh, that the apartments have different rents. We would like very much to see this. Uh, uh, I think that we will be able to to do the actual equalizations very soon when the computer program is uh, is out. John, I was I was interested in the material in your response to uh, Mr. Fink's submissions on your uh, cost revenue statement that you had a line in there that the landlord was indifferent to equalization. Could could you explain that? Well, yes, the act. And, and the regulations taken together suggest that if the minister awards a rent increase in something other than a uniform percentage, he, she has to ensure, it's still a she, <laughs> this week anyway, <laughs> after question period, who knows? But yeah, the, there's 11.05. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the minister <coughs> has to ensure that the landlord receives the justified rent increase. So a landlord who doesn't propose equalization may be somewhat indifferent to it being applied at the urging of the tenants. And by the way, that's a pattern I find. If we propose e equalization, the tenants oppose it. If we don't oppose it, if we don't propose it, they would like it. Uh, and so quite often, we're saying, look, all we want to get is our money out, out of this. If we approve $100,000, give us our $100,000. It ha you have to be very very careful, however, because the minister may in fact come up with numbers which give you $100,000 in a certain permutation of rental increases, but you are limited by notice provisions under the Act and under the Landlord and Tenant Act. And if in fact the minister awards you, he says, well, fine, we're going to permute rents in such a fashion that apartment four is 300, and you gave notice for 350, there is no problem. But if he says, on the other hand, apartment five will be 325, and you gave notice for 300, that's a big problem. Because while on paper, he may be giving you what's called maximum rents, uh, and he may even say you can collect these because it's within what you applied for, you have a notice provision problem. Uh, what they perhaps should have done is to have a clause in this act which appeared in the Residential Complexes Financing Cost Restraint Act, which said, in effect, that the amount awarded by the minister is collectible. Let me um, introduce a, a new topic. Let me introduce you to a brand new tribunal in Ontario created, to my knowledge, for the first time. It's under Section 14 of the statute. It's called the Residential rental standards board and we could have a whole day on that and I've got three minutes so let me compress it. Um, the board has has two functions. Number one, it's going to create provincial standards for maintenance, health, occupancy and safety and uh, of the occupation of uh, rental apartment buildings and those standards will apply in municipalities which do not have property standards bylaws under the, made under the Planning Act. Secondly, it's going to receive orders from inspectors in municipalities which do have property standards bylaws. The, the Standards Board is actively seeking uh, those orders to be sent to it, what I would call uh, work orders or property standards orders. And when they get those orders, the Board will investigate and it's going to attempt to determine 
whether the order represents substantial noncompliance with a substantial standard that is subsisting. It's hard to say. I call it the triple S finding. So you have to have a substantial standard, you've got to have a substantial violation, and it's got to be continuing. If they find that, even for one item in the order, uh, say an order has ten items on it, and one of them is of that character, the whole order is sent to the minister. And the minister on her own motion, or can deliver a notice of motion, and she'll say that if that work order is not cleared, I am going to stay or suspend your right to collect rent increases. And if it's not done by the time I say it should be done, you're going to forfeit those rent increases. The order can be made looking backwards up to nine months, because very often you'll find that work orders uh, have a somewhat long history to them, and of course can go forward. It is a substantial new area of concern to landlords, and I thought we just might spend a couple of minutes uh, on it with the panel. Let me start uh, with you, Mr. Renecki, again. Uh, suppose the landlord does the work, um, and it is of sufficient uh, magnitude that it qualifies as a capital expenditure and an application for whole building review is made with that item showing up in the cost revenue statement. What's the fit between what the standards board is doing or the minister is doing in terms of her penalty orders and, and what you're trying to do with the, the rent review increase? Okay. Well, if, if there is a situation, we haven't had one like that yet in Etobicoke, or at least where the landlord is on the one hand applying on, under Section 74 for whole building review, and on the other hand there is a standard board report uh, uh, notifying uh, uh, that the landlord uh, is not meeting substantial municipal standards, uh, in theory these two should go on separate tracks. Uh, 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 we try to uh, to to uh, s to check whether there are any uh, any other applications or any other motions uh, 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 when we are considering a 74 application. But uh, uh, if the tenants if en if the tenants bring this as an as evidence of uh, of a decrease in maintenance, uh, uh, this would have to be looked at by the administrator. Uh, uh, but. Uh, Short of this, I think that we would uh, go on separate tracks here. We can tie the increases ordered in 74 uh, with the with the order of the minister and the uh, the standard board to report uh, and say you you are given 10 percent increase, but you are you cannot uh, you you cannot uh, collect it until uh, you improve these uh, things. Richard, let me pursue with you something that uh, Mr. Renecki said uh, that the tenants might raise this as a defense to the application in terms of a decline in the standard of repair. Do you see the standards board as a, uh, forming a substantial weapon in the arsenal of uh, tenants' representatives? Well, there's one item we, we haven't mentioned yet this morning, and that is deliberate ongoing neglect, uh, which is a defense uh, to capital repairs. In essence, what you're saying is that the capital repair wouldn't be necessary in the first place if the landlord had been doing his job of keeping the building uh, maintained over the years and uh, it is a, a defense uh, to the allowance of capital repairs. I think what the tenants are doing uh, are uh, looking at the defenses being uh, unanswered uh, standards board uh, recommendations or orders can be an absolute defense to rent increases. Uh, they're looking at deliberate odd no going neglect uh, and they're looking at uh, whether or not the landlord is in fact going to comply with various work orders or standard boards uh, orders and actually do the work, and, and is it substantially completed e even as of yet? Now, contrary to what you've heard from me all morning, tenants are very reasonable. Uh, if the landlord is in fact uh, doing the work, the work is uh, needed, and it's not needed because uh, of neglect, uh, that the tenants uh, may take a moderate stand, which may convince the administrators uh, to allow many of the rent increases forward. And I think uh, one's looking to see uh, what the history is in the building. Uh, and I can assume that the worst shape the building is in, the angrier the tenants are going to be, and, and the, uh, the more dug in is they're going to be their stance. John, let me, let me pursue ongoing deliberate neglect with you. Are the tenants being reasonable? Is it being raised as a substantial defense to capital expenditures? Well, I see it being raised more and more in the last uh, two or three months. Um, and, and I guess from a landlord's perspective, how do you answer the charge? 
I have one case, for example, where it's being raised. It's a case which hit the press about two weeks ago. And what's interesting is that it's important, if you can, to look for indicators to say that they're wrong. Now, number one, in the case I have in mind, the previous landlord made application for rent review two years ago. And at that time, there was a finding that there was no deterioration in the standard of maintenance. A year later, my client acquires it and after holding it for a year, commences certain it items of major work. So you know right away that unless the tenants can prove that there was rapid neglect within a short period of time, accompanied by a rapid deterioration in, in, in the stock, their case is very weak. Because in my view, and I think in the view of certainly Bob and, and Julius, uh, the neglect question turns around uh, consequential damage, i.e., had uh, was the work caused as a result of deliberate neglect, i.e., would the cost have been 100000 had it been, been, been properly maintained over the years, but, through, but, but because of a deliberate policy of neglect, the cost is 200000 in which case, if the tenants could make that case, I would say you would allow the first hundred, but not the second hundred. But if you're acting for a landlord, you have to try to look to past a rent review history. You also, t to meet this kind of challenge, have to have a very good sense of your client's modus operandi. What we have been doing uh, in capital applications, uh, in some instances, is have the landlord write out in detail his company's whole approach to routine maintenance and how he, do, does he have preventative maintenance programs in, in place? Does he normally do certain things in a cycle? And if you have this, this information, it's better, it's easier for you to uh, defend against the tenant charge that there was ongoing and deliberate neglect. Of course, Another way of doing it, in my view, is to go through what Bob Domeni mentioned earlier. That is the, the conditional order under Section 89 of the Act. In my view, the question of, of neglect has to arise at that point. And, and under the, the conditional order process, the landlord is holding off and carrying out the capital expense until he gets a decision as to what will, will be allowed. And quite frankly, at that stage, if the tenants don't bring it up, I would make some leading statements to try and draw out such a debate and prove at that point that in fact there was no, no neglect so that when my client proceeds with the work, there is no way that defense can be used by the tenants. That makes sense. I propose to deal with one more topic. We're a bit behind, but I want to touch on the operating manual, which is the larger of the two volumes, uh, which was handed out this morning. I don't think it, it sort of appeared and was referred to, but I don't think we've made a clear statement of what it is and how it's used and whether it is binding on the administrator. So perhaps I'd ask Mr. Renecki just to tell us a bit about it. You've got this book, book here, um, uh, the Rent Review Operating Guide Draft. It's no longer a draft. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an administrative manual that is uh, tying uh, all the operations of the rent review services all across the province in 21 uh, offices. Uh, the first question, uh, someone came over to me and said, I'm missing part seven. You won't find all the parts, all the, all the uh, uh, chapters in this book yet because uh, what, uh, what is being done right now is that uh, the sections of it are being worked out and added by us. So the fact that you don't have section 7 or don't have section 12 doesn't mean that something is missing. It's simply not available yet. It is an administrative manual that, uh, that provides for the employees of uh, the Ministry of Housing and Review Services uh, the Ministry's uh, interpretation of the Act and, uh, the, uh, and the regulations. One of the complaints that was raised uh, 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 about the old uh, Act was that um, the Act gave so much discretion to commissioners uh, 
that uh, the same set of circumstances would have produced a different decision, dep uh, different order depending on, uh, on, the, uh, on the commissioner. Uh, and uh, that, that was uh, something that, uh, that uh, uh, the cabinet decided to uh, change. And uh, the guide shouldn't be seen as one more huge book to be read, but it should be seen, first of all, as a way in which the ministry provides for, uh, uh, for some uh, um, uh, usage uh, across the province by its various employees. And secondly, it is also something that is given to the public. It's available to you. Uh, even if you don't attend this seminar, it's available to you at every office of Rendezvous Services you, where, you can, uh, where you can peruse the, the manual and see what are the steps and what, uh, uh, that, that the procedure should take and what is the interpretation of the various provisions of the Act and the regulations that the Ministry has accepted. In, uh, uh, I would suggest to you that it's a great help both for us as employees and for the clients, be it tenants or landlords, because they have now greater certainty, if not 100% certainty, greater certainty, and they can uh, see ahead of the applications how these applications are going to be treated. John, let me pursue a, a point that, that Mr. Ernecki mentioned. Uh, it does indicate the interpretation uh, that the Rent Review uh, Services Division is, is placing on various parts of the Act and regulations. Uh, reasonable people can disagree about things. What do you do if you have an application and your view is, is opposite to, to the interpretation being put in the guide? Well, I do two things. First of all, and, the, and by the way, there are a number of cases where, in my view, and I think I've discussed this with a number of lawyers, including Bob and Julius up, up here, the number of areas in which the, the guide seems in conflict with the, the Act and the regulations. Uh, I'll mention one briefly before I answer the question directly, and that is in, in the area of capital expenditures. When you get hold of this blue book, you will come across regulation 440 87 and uh, clause one I guess it's it, it's clause one C of that deals with what are capital expenditures and there's one type which deals with uh, items which to, to qualify as capital expenditures they have to apply to 25 percent of the units in the building or rather they have to affect 25% of the units in, in, in the building, or equal 1% of rental revenue by way of a rent increase. The guide goes much further. The guide says that the word affect in the context of the regulation means work done directly in the units. Now, those of you who have done Landlord and Tenant Act cases will be very surprised by that, because there have been a number of cases in district court which have said that, uh, you know, Tenants are certainly affected by much more than goes on in their units. And I know of cases where tenants have got rent abatements because of problems in the common area. Now, that's a case where I think th there's a divergence. What we do are twofold. We make a clear submission to the minister that we disagree with the what, outs what, what is outlined in the guide. and. And through the procedure of that case, uh, we try and uh, have the minister's delegate, the administrator, disregard the guide. Because as far as I'm concerned, he or she's bound by the act and the regulations only. Secondly, I guess we try and write to the policy branch or the legal branch of, of the ministry, explaining that, uh, that the guide conflicts. The difficulty is this. Er, uh, earlier on, Richard mentioned that there are so many pages of act and regulations in this blue book. And I guess from, from the minister's point of view, the guide distills everything. And so if you're a hardworking administrator, this, as opposed to the act and the regulations, becomes your Bible. Because this is, after all, what your superiors have decided is a proper interpretation of the act and the regulations. John, I have to interject here. In our training, we stress to administrators uh, that uh, the Act and the regulations are the final authority. We really meaning, do. Without we, we meaning to argue, Mr. Renecki, <laughs> I've been told too many times by administrators, uh, for example, on this item of a 
of capital expenditure. Personally, John, I agree with you, but the guide says I should do it this way, and that's what I've done. You're free to appeal, but I appreciate you coming. Thank you. We'll be appealing this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> We have a, a large number of questions, uh, but I'm anxious that, that you hear from Julius because he has some important things to tell you. We'll try to get back to the questions. We'll sort through them uh, before the lunch break. Thank you. Maybe I can excuse Mr. Renecki, uh, John Andrade, and Bob Demanian. We'll introduce uh, Julius.